We may never stop the screen capture. Um, so like I said, you uh, should be aware, full disclosure, that both the room um, and the screen are um, being captured. There are no really great, there are no great microphones going on. So this microphone works pretty well, and the machine one works only as well as it works, and there's no, there's no other recording equipment. So the interactivity can be kind of normal. Can you tell that I'm nervous? Um, so, uh, at the last lecture, we went very, very quickly through a classic algorithm for solving a classic problem. Um, there were lots of things that were new about this problem. One was that we actually were running algorithms or simulating algorithms on directed graphs. Um, and it was only the second time where we had seen weights associated with any of the graphs. So um, while it's true that the purpose of this meeting is to talk specifically about the complexity and the correctness of the last algorithm that we talked about, I'm also going to go over the execution of that algorithm a little bit, um, just because I felt like we went too fast before. So first point is what problem are we solving? Um, we are solving the problem of given a start vertex and a weighted directed graph, find the shortest path to every other vertex in the graph. And in fact, it isn't, you don't even need to say every other vertex in the graph. You can just say every vertex in the graph because in the, in the end, um, the shortest path from the start will still be zero. Okay, so any questions before we start? Any questions about the setup? So I am relying on some of your intuition about what marks a path, what marks a shortest path. Um, in this context, we're we're denoting path length by the sum of edge points. So, for example, I can look at this graph and say the shortest path from S to G is S to C to G, and it has distance or weight or cost eight. And what I'm saying when I do that is that every other path, should they exist, from S to G is longer than that. There may be other paths from S to G, but they are all longer than the one that I described. So path lengths are sums of weights, and shortest is the smallest such sum. Okay, any questions about all of that? That's the setup. That's like the trailer to the movie, basically. All right, so. Uh, I want to go through the algorithm again, um, and there are two things I want you to pay attention to as we go. Um, I want you to pay attention to um, priority Q. That is, as we go through the algorithm at the end, I'm going to say, okay, which of these things were priority Q operations? And I want you to pay attention to any situation, any case, any moment where the graph implementation itself matters. So, um, so as we execute this pseudocode, as we execute this algorithm, be aware of those two things because they are going to play an important role in the analysis that we do in a few minutes. Okay, so what does this whole thing say to do? Much like the pseudocode that we saw for uh, breadth first search, there is setup involved. This setup is the same kind of bookkeeping that we did there. It says set all of the distances um, to big numbers. And we're going to call it infinity. If you were actually implementing this, you might use maxint or the maximum of all the edge weights, or, or no, that doesn't work, times the number of edges, some big number. It doesn't really matter which one it is. And we're going to set the distance to the start vertex to zero. Furthermore, we're going to give ourselves this administrative structure. Um, I actually don't know whether the P stands for parent or predecessor. I always thought it was predecessor, but then I saw that Will was calling it parent. So it doesn't really matter in any case. It denotes where you came from. And notice that where you came from works whether you whether you attach it to the word predecessor or parents. It's kind of it's kind of strangely the same. 
So uh, at the start, we don't know where any where we came from for any of the vertices. Okay, any question about that? Now, here's what we're going to do. We are going to take the n current best distances, that is, the entries in this table, the entries in that dictionary, these labels, and we're going to throw them into a priority queue. All right? So initialize a priority queue containing the D sub Ks, where K is a vertex, so all of them. So how many things are in the priority queue? That is how big in the priority queue? Number of vertices, we typically call that N, good. And uh, what one is going to be given to us if we ask for it first? What's the very first one that's going to be handed to us? S, that's right, the source. Good, 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 good. So it's, you know, if we're implementing this thing as a heap, then uh, the source is sitting at the top and everything else is tied beneath it. All right, and any question about all of that so far? So that's the setup. And then we're just going to repeat these steps n times. Now, it might be uh, good to think of this as while the priority queue is not empty. Because that makes it look very much like the structure of the code that we use for breadth first search. Except that instead of a priority queue, we're using, I mean, instead of a queue, we're using a priority queue. Any question about that? So, and in fact, it's the same thing. And there is some, uh, there is some foreshadowing going on here because we recognize that the algorithm, it says it's going to repeat these steps n times, and that's the same as while the priority queue is not empty, and we already know there are n things in the priority queue. So those three things are kind of all wrapped up together into this, into this structure. Okay, any question about that? So these two, these are not both happening, it's or here. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. All right, so what do we do? Here's the amazing thing. This is just like breadth first search, right? In breadth first search, we say, hey, Q, I need the next thing. Here we say, hey, priority Q, I need the next thing. So uh, this is find the minimum D unlabeled vertex V. We are handed S, and then the uh, algorithm says label vertex V. Just like breadth first search, exactly like breadth first search. No difference at all. Then, so any question about that? So for my purposes, I'm labeling things by putting a little circle around them. Okay, you can imagine either a Boolean flag or throwing things into a set, any, any of many different implementations that will work perfectly fine. Okay, all right, so we've done that for S. I'll put a little blue check mark here. And then, look, again, it's exactly like breadth first search again. For all neighbors of V. Oh, it also says unlabeled here. In breadth first search, we broke that out and put it in a conditional. We said if it's unlabeled, then we do all these interesting things. Otherwise, we basically ignore it. In this case, we roll that conditional into the for loop. But it's still just a for loop over the neighbors, right? Where we ignore the ones that are already labeled. Okay, so for loop over the neighbors. This is a moment where you might want to think about the implications of that for loop going down a row of an adjacency matrix versus that for loop going over the elements of an adjacency list. Okay? Any question about that? That, di that uh, distinction? All right? Seems okay? All right. Then. Here's the interesting step. So now we've set up this for loop over, it looks like these two things. Now, here's what we're going to do. What we want to know is whether in our traversal we have found a better path than already exists. Well, it's not too hard at this stage because the path to C that already exists at the start is horrible. So what we want to evaluate is whether or not 
the cost of getting to the current vertex, which I know, yes, is the source, plus the cost of going from that vertex to the new one is less than what we knew about before, then we do the following. We change the cost of the new one to be that improved cost. And we update the parent to denote, or the P, the predecessor, to denote where we came from in order to do it. Any question about that? Amy? what used to be the cost of getting to the, what we knew of before to get to the new vertex. Okay, yeah? Only if I want to know what the paths are. So at the end, remind me, ask me again, okay? Ask me again about those parents and why we have them, okay? Yeah? What exactly is that? That's part of the, that's a great question. The question is what's the cost function? And the answer is it's part of the data associated with the edge. So that is the weight of the edge. I could have put weight or I don't know, whatever. Okay? So excellent. It's a it's part of the data in the graph itself. We get that part for free and we can look it up in constant time. We assume we can look it up in constant time. Alright, any other questions about that step? So I'm gonna do 30 seconds of silence. And I want you to do the very same thing on the graph that I did for C because um, S has another neighbor. So think through those steps and update S's other edge, that is finish up this for loop um, in this context, okay? Ready? I'm going to do it to uh, the cost. Okay, well that was compelling. All right, any question about it? Any question? All right, now, I want you to do a little sketch of what's in the priority queue. Okay, think about what's in the priority queue right now. What's in the priority queue right now? C's in the priority queue, what else? What's What's in the priority queue? C, F, D, E, G, B. They're all there, right? They're all, all of the labels except for A's are still in the priority queue. Except for S, sorry. Different slides, different semester, who knows. Uh, right, except for S are in the priority queue. Any question about that? Okay, and we're done with this iteration. All right, so we're going to go back up. Is the priority queue empty? No, okay. So, hey, priority queue, give me the minimum cost D. Which one does it give me? C, good, that's right. I'm going to label C, so now C and S are part of the labeled set. They're not unlabeled is most interesting. Um, and now I need to set up a for loop across C's outgoing neighbors and do what's called the update step. So this is an update. Now notice that in contrast to breadth first search, breadth first search just stamps edges, right? It says, I see you, I see you, I see you, and keeps going. Here there's a little bit more complexity to it. We're, we're, we're having to do some computation and some updating and it's just a little bit more complex. It's a little wiser. Um, it's a smarter algorithm. So what does this do? My distance of getting to C so far is 3. So this is 3 plus the cost of going from C to G is 5. That's 8. Is that better than infinity? Why, yes it is. And so we change that value to 8 and mark the fact that we have done so. Any question about that? All right, let's keep going. That's, that's the only outgoing edge from C. So we go back up. Is the priority queue empty? No. no. What's at the top? What's, what is the priority queue going to hand us? It's going to hand us F. That's right. Because F's D is smaller than any of the other unlabeled ones. 
Okay, so we're going to label F and update F's neighbors. 3 plus 7 is 10, and we come here. 3 plus 7 is 10, and we come here, and that's it. Any question about that? Feel good? Okay. Um, and now we go back up again and we say, hey, priority Q, give me the least cost vertex. And what does it give us? It gives us G, right? Did you say G or D? I only heard E. It gives us G, that's right. So now we label G. And now this is the first time where that for loop looks a little bit different. Um, we're labeling the outgoing edge, or we're setting up a for loop on the unlabeled outgoing edges, right? So there is this edge over here, but it goes to a labeled place. And so really we're not going to consider that one. Now if you were actually implementing this, you would set up the for loop over all the incident edges and you'd go, oh, I've been there before, and you would ignore it, just like regular search does. Okay? But we're not gonna we're not gonna go, oh look, eight plus ten is more than zero. Because there's no reason to do that. Okay, so eight plus seven is better than infinity, so this is fifteen, and this goes back here. Any question? And now we're done with G. We go back up to the priority queue. What does the priority queue hand us? D or E. We don't have any idea which one. I'm going to take D because it's the sort of the simplest to deal with on the graph itself. But that's an arbitrary choice. Um, it makes, I guess, the unfolding of this slightly more interesting. Okay, so we're going to take D. We label it, we set up a for loop on its outgoing edges, and then we query. If 2 plus 10 is better than 10, is it? No. So we're done. There are no more outgoing edges. We ignore the update step. All right. We go back to the priority queue, and it gives us E. We update E. E's outgoing edges is 2 plus 10 better than 15? Why, yes it is. So this becomes 12 and we redirect the predecessor. So B now goes there. Okay? Any question? Yeah? Why do we not add an edge to the bottom to Because our whole goal is to find the shortest path. And we don't care about a more expensive path. Because we only want the shortest paths. This, if we, if this were a, a, a intermediate algorithms class, we would call this a greedy algorithm, because we found we're we're going to keep the current best one at any stage. We're not going to, um, for a moment, have a more expensive one because we think there might be a cheaper one later. We've got negative. We don't have negative edge weight, so that can't happen here. Okay. All right. Any other questions about this? Yeah. So the question is, would the edge weight be the cost or the distance? And I'm going to go back at you with that and say, does it matter? Actually, we don't know what the cost represents. So it is the weight. It's, it might be a cost in terms of money, or it might be a cost in terms of time, or it might be a cost in terms of distance, but it's really just a weight. It's just a number associated with the edge. So you can think of it as a distance if you like. Because you, because I noticed that you meant the um, distance of vertex plus cost of uh, e. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so cost in terms of, of time or space right. to get to the next so one. So would distance of vertex be like the total cost just from getting from S to S? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So D, the, the, the structure D, that it's a hash basically, D of V is the current best way of getting to V from the start. Okay, yeah, Amy? How did we get 12 there? Because it we were processing D. We were processing D. And oh, sorry, we were processing E. And the best to get to E was 10. 
And the cost of going from E to B was two. You can't see it here very well. There's a two, this two. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, there's all this stuff that I'm forgetting to do here in this. Yes, yes, right here is where what it really should look like. Okay, all good? Okay. So we've updated B and we're done with E. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, and now we go back to the priority queue. How many things are in the priority queue right now? Only B is there, that's right. So the system hands us B. And that last step, that last step, there's no place, there are no unlabeled edges, right? It's a vacuous iteration. In fact, this might be n minus 1 times, but we don't really care, okay? It doesn't really matter. There's, the for loop is empty. There's nothing to be done. Any question about it? Yeah? Um, would it not check what? Oh, F. So, so we have already found a shortest path to F. We know it. The minute we label something, we are done with it. There can be no shorter path to it. So there's actually no reason to look back into the label set. We are going to talk about this more carefully when we discuss the correctness of the algorithm. Okay? That's why this says for all unlabeled neighbors, um, B will have no unlabeled neighbors. Yeah? Yeah, good. Yes, that's what, that's what I want to talk about next. Yes, okay, so we have executed the whole algorithm. We've got the Ds, which were the best path length to each vertex, but we also have the Ps. So when you want to know the shortest distance between S and E, you start with E and you look at the parents. Start with E and say, where did I come from to get to E? Oh, I came from F. Where did I come from to get to F? Oh, I came from S. And so the path is the reverse of that, S, F. Any question about that? I didn't actually up do the update on B. I'm a little nervous about it. So B actually comes from here now because 12 was created by that. Okay. Any questions? Now, you could, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and go through all the vertices and list out their shortest paths. If you were creating kind of the completion of all of this and you wanted to draw a picture on a map on the web or something, you might actually do that. Go ahead and trace all of those predecessor or parent edges. So I'm going to do that for a second. What do you notice about those? What do you notice about those P's? If you look at them as a collection? Uh, it's one disjoint set. Yes, it's one set. What's special about them? Yeah? It's a spanning tree. That's right. That will always be the case. That those P's will be some spanning tree of the graph. Okay. Now, do you have any reason to believe that this is a minimum spanning tree? Is this, did we just discover a new algorithm for a minimum spanning tree? Do this. Now why? Why not? How do we know for sure this is not going to be a minimum total cost spanning tree? Yeah? Uh, there, are, there won't be cycles in this. This is a spanning tree. But how do we know it's not, not necessarily a minimum total cost? Yeah? The minimum, there, there is a corresponding algorithm that's also greedy for minimum spanning trees. Yeah? Yeah, good. And that might actually have been, you have given us a shorter spanning tree of those vertices. Yes, good. So there's nothing in this necessarily that optimizes a single connection to the thing because we do this, this, we care about how much it has cost us to get to where we are, 
But there's a simpler reason, and that is minimum spanning trees are only defined on undirected graphs. So minimum spanning tree actually doesn't even have a meaning in the context of this graph. So that's another reason why there's certainly no guarantee that what we get out of the algorithm is um, a minimum spanning tree. And then otherwise, there's just a counterexample. If these were undirected edges, then your counterexample would be correct, that we should have chosen that two-way edge instead. OK, any other questions about this? OK, so I think we're finally to the part. Like, if this were the course of the semester, I would be pretty happy with um, the depth with which we covered the algorithm. Now, I think that the, the time we just spent right here was more time than we spent on it in class. It was probably also more time than Will's class spent. I don't know. Are you in Will's class? And so I now I'm finally happy with the depth of coverage of this algorithm. OK, so the question is running time. And how are we going to analyze the running time? So what I want from you first is an asterisk by the thing whose complexity is determined by the priority queue, and the things, I should say, and a uh, triangle by the things whose running times are determined by the um, graph implementation. What? Yeah, the running time. Things dependent on the priority queue. Um, and the way we're going to do this is you go ahead and do it and then peek at your neighbors and see if they could ask us by the same parts you did. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to run my blue pencil down and you're going to tell me where to stop when something, uh, when something is affected by the priority queue. Yeah, like you were supposed to say stop right there. Yes, okay, I'm going to keep going. You're supposed to say stop there. Good, because that's, yeah, good. Huh? Keep going? No way I'm not keeping going. No way. Think about this for a second. When you change this value, when you've got those Ds on the left-hand side of an assignment statement, that, that D is already playing a role in the priority queue, right? And what are you doing? You are reducing its value, thereby increasing its priority effectively or moving it if it's a heap you're moving it up the heap or your you know whatever your implementation is you're moving it closer to being the next one so it's hidden but that reassignment of a priority is a priority queue operation dun 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 okay now i have a question for you that just feels it feels like the right moment if we are implementing the priority queue as a heap What's the cost of that reassignment, that revaluation, the change? What's the very, with the worst case, how expensive will it be to change that priority from whatever it was to whatever it is now? Log n is correct, the height of the structure. So our little note, our little cloud thought here is if the priority queue is a heap, then this costs uh, a theta of n, theta of log of n operation. Log of n because n is the number of vertices in the graph. If we implement it as a heap, if we implement it as a heap, and it was at the bottom of the heap, and we change its 
its distance, its current best distance, to be, oh, I don't know, two, then it probably is going to move all the way up the structure. The height of the heap is log n. Okay, all operations, all operations in, in moving around on that heap are proportional to the height of the structure. All right, any questions about it? So that's a little bit of a hidden thing. Okay, so now let's go down, let's do the same thing. You tell me which ones are affected specifically by the graph implementation. And I actually have only one of these. I have only one of these, and you, I think you already know, but I might be wrong, so you just tell me. Stop. Yeah, okay, fine. So we have to put the graph in the structure. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Yep, right there. That's right. That's a triangle. Good. And how about this? This stuff. No, those are just hash tables. Those P's, that, those P's and D's, man, they are efficient structures. Okay, they are keyed by a vertex, and they're going to sort of assume they're associative arrays. Yeah. Either that, or you choose um, small integer identifiers, so you can use an array, but you use your array like a hash table, basically. You need some kind of associative array where the indices are the identifiers for the vertices and the edges, the vertices in this case. Okay. Yeah, because you need the, um, you need the adjacency matrix. So it's n squared, that is, if adjacency matrix. Um, it's uh, n plus m if lists. One in the four. Yes, right. For all, the, which one? Oh, this cost right here, this right here. We're going to assume that that's always constant time. That if you tell me, um, if you tell me two endpoints, I can get to their cost in constant time. You're, uh, you're right. It's an issue of where we store it. But I'm going to assume that we can get to individual edges themselves efficiently but I can't iterate over them. I can't iterate over an adjacent or a vertex. I don't know what the endpoint. If you give me the endpoints, I can find an edge. If you only give me one endpoint, I can't. Okay, yeah? For, because of the for loop? Yeah, we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at all of the pieces. All right, any questions so far? Okay, so now here's something that's gonna blow your minds. We're going to talk for a second about the priority queue implementation. So your, your instinct is correct that one of the priority queues that we have to consider is a heap, right? We spent a week on it in this class. It would be silly if we didn't consider a heap as one of our priority queue implementations. But the other priority queue implementation that we're going to consider is an unsorted array or an unsorted uh, dic uh, dictionary of some kind, associative array. So that this update step is constant time. Okay? So if we change that current best one, we don't change where it lives in the structure. Okay? It's just because we don't care. We don't care where they are. Now, I have a question for you. What does that change? What's the implication of that change? I'm going to put all of this stuff in green. So um, suppose we use an unsorted array for the priority queue. What changes? Yeah? Yes. This changes. And we already talked about the fact that this changes. What happened? Well, this is now free. And what's the running time for find min then? 
N. That's right. So we have to see if we care about that. All right, so I think you know about all of the important parts of the analysis. So let's go put it all together, okay? Are there any questions about all of that discussion? It's a little hard to have the conversation along two axes at the same time, but I think all of the important points are there. Happy? Okay. Okay, so I made this matrix, or this little table, where the priority queue implementation choice is down the left, and the graph implementation choice is across the top. And I went ahead and I filled in the complexities for each one of these. And I think the way to do this is um, to take each box and spell them out, to point out where, where each piece of the running time comes from. Uh, let's see. First of all, though, there's one conversation we do not need to have. One of those four quadrants there is completely dominated by the other. If you would never do this graph implementation together with this, uh, with this priority queue. Which one is it? Which of those running times is dominated by all others? What is it? Which one? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, good. The adjacency matrix and the heap. That's right. Because if this is the dominant term, then you can do that well by these. And if this is the dominant term, then you can do that well by these. So there's no reason to ever do this. I believe that this is the one, in case you were in Will's lecture, I think you, um, I think you covered only that box. So I want to talk about the other boxes too. We'll talk about that one, but we'll also talk about um, the other boxes as well. So n log n comes from, oh, repeat these steps, n times remove min. And this is n times remove min. Right? There you go. Now, here's the thing. We've got an adjacency list and this for loop. So how many times does that mean this goes? How many times does that mean that executes? n times, that's right. And every one of those n times, you may do a priority key update. So this is m updates, and this is the priority queue. m updates of priority queue. Okay, in the for loop. Any question about that? Yeah? M refers to, so um, it doesn't, it's not going to matter because you're going to add, eventually you're going to look at every outgoing edge. And you're either going to, you're either going to do an update, in the worst case, you will do an update for every edge. In the worst case, Every edge that you see invokes an update. And you're always moving away from, you don't have any edges back into the labeled set. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. We're going to talk about that row in just a second. Yep, we're still talking about a heap. Okay, any other questions about that cell? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Yes, we drop the constant. That's right. All of these are asymptotic, and they actually should be tight bound. Yeah. Sorry. In the worst. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 
in for for the one on the term on the right, yes. it's the it's the time of the update. For the term on the left, n log n is the remove means. Okay. Yeah, it's m times you might have to do a change of the of the priority. Okay, everybody happy? It's it's not that bad, right? Okay, so now let's talk about the unsorted array. Now the thing I want to point out is that in that case. This is bound, the cost of the update step, I'll put all of this in red. Okay, the cost of the update step in that case is still going to be just constant time. Because you're just changing values to which you have constant time access. And so it's determined by the number of iterations in the for loop. That's it. It's not determined by, it's not determined by the cost of any one of those particular things. Okay? All good? Okay. So now, though, notice that we're going to do n times a remove min. In this case, the remove min is theta of n. So the collection of remove mins is n squared. And... Yes, exactly. Yeah, because think about it. <laughs> you think at the minimum, you just go, you just, you, this was like one of the first algorithms you wrote in 110, probably. You, um, you set up a variable to keep track of the current minimum, and you went off in search of them, and you kept that one, and that was a linear time operation, right? So you can always find the minimum in n time, and that's what we're talking about here, that very naive, uh, naive algorithm. Okay, so n squared is the total remove min cost, and moreover, the total update cost is the same because you're going to do this either m times or, I'm sorry, either degree of v times or n times. So this is either happening either n or degree of v times, right? That's how much time that costs you. If it's degree of v, then this bounds the running time. So that takes care of this. This is really n squared plus m, but m is dominated because it's a connected graph. Um, and then this one is n squared plus another n squared. So this is n squared for um, update step over the algorithm, and this is m for update over the algorithm. Okay, any questions? Yeah? <laughs> okay, we got to keep going. We have, we have essentially five minutes left, so, yeah? Yeah, 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 that, they, yeah, it's still n squared. That's, okay. that's, those are my notes. My, those are my recognizing that we've got these two big important parts that we need to account for, and they're both n squared. Yes? Um, uh, the reason we can eliminate the degree in the adjacency matrix is because the Hanshaking theorem actually um, doesn't apply here because you actually have to look at every one of them. There's really a factor of n. Yes? Because you're um, removing the minimum n times. So it's, it's remove the minimum, that costs you n, and you do that n times. So it's like a nested for loop, really. Right, mm -hmm. but for the plus n squared. Yep. Right. Yes, so you're still doing this for all unlabeled neighbors n times. Because this thing is still around the whole thing. Okay, yeah? Same? Okay, good. All right, so let's do this quickly. So what implementation, this is, this is the bread and butter. This is where you're in, your, um, you're in your design meeting and you are the ones who uh, can do the trade-offs between implementation alternatives, okay? So if you happen to know that your graph is sparse, that is if there aren't very many edges, you should choose one of these implementations. Which one is it? Yes, so if your graph is sparse, you should use adjacency list 
plus heap. Otherwise, if your graph is dense, then you might as well use an unsorted array and anything else and whatever. Okay, any questions? An unsorted array priority queue and whatever graph. Because they're both on square. Okay, happy? What's the running time if you make the mistake and you have a dense graph and you use a heap and an adjacency list? Then? Then it's n squared log n. Yeah. So, uh, Will Clark did mention this. There's another data structure that you can use for heap called a Fibonacci heap that still costs you log in to, up to uh, remove min, but it's constant time to update. So it's kind of the best of both worlds here, but you would know how to deal with that in this case because you've got all the pieces. They didn't look at it in detail, right? No detail. He, after class, he said, I even got through Fibonacci heaps. I'm like, no, you didn't. That's not true. Okay, so why does Dijkstra's work? Why does Dijkstra's work? So the graph, or the proof here is spelled out. It's a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume that it does work through several iterations. And then we're going to assume that it doesn't work on the k plus first iteration. Okay? So there, they, this might be the first iteration, might be the second iteration, might be the 84th. But if there's some point at which it doesn't work, then, uh, then we're in trouble, then we, then we have no proof. So we're going to assume that that's the case and aim for a contradiction. All right, so the um, Dijkstra's algorithm finds the correct shortest path to the first k vertices. That means that the d sub v are the shortest paths. for all labeled vertices. Okay, you're done with them. You never look at them again. They don't play a role in the algorithm after you're done with them. Okay, and those are the ones that live in the cloud. Now, we're going to be the one, the, we're going to let, we're going to be assuming that U is the one that's given to us by the algorithm, given to us by the algorithm in the next step. So. Its D is smaller than anything else out here. So DU is smallest, but there is some other path from S to U because this, it's not the shortest path. Okay? Any question about that? So then there is some other shorter path from S to U, and we're going to call it P. Any questions? Okay, because it failed, the algorithm failed, so that minimum one that the algorithm hands us isn't the best one. We, we can find a better one, okay? But come on, that can't be, that can't be. There can be no other P that's shorter because that P had to go out of the labeled set somewhere. It had to go out of the cloud. Let this be the first vertex that it hit out of the cloud. What do we know about dy? What do we know about dy? Specifically about its relationship to du. It's at least as big. Yeah, that's right. But what, what does that say about p? Yeah, that's right. So, but P is even longer. So, that means, but that's a contradiction. Because P was supposed to be the shortest one. P was shorter by assumption. So our assumption that we failed on the k plus first vertex is incorrect, which means that k plus vertex was the best one. Okay. Any question about that? So that's the cloud proof. That's all there is to it. Yeah? 
because my because the algorithm gave us you as the, the least weight one among all of them. Okay? So there is no shorter path because otherwise dy would have been smaller. Okay, good enough? Okay, so now I want to take you back to negative weight edges because remember, Dijkstra's only works for non-negative weight edges. You can't have negative weight edges. This is tied really closely to the cloud proof. In fact, if you can have negative weight edges, the cloud proof doesn't work. So let's run Dijkstra's on this graph because it will illustrate it. It'll illustrate it perfectly. And we're going to start from S here, slightly different than before. We're going uh, to run into the problem fairly quickly, so I'm actually even going to look at this little tiny subgraph piece that I can almost reach. Okay, so we start the algorithm, we label S, and we update S's neighbors. Okay? And now we're done with S forever. We're never coming back to S. And we go back to the priority queue, and priority queue gives us E. That's right. So now we're done with E, and we update uh, E's neighbors like this. And now the and now the algorithm gives us oh, four, sorry, four. Good. And now the algorithm gives us D, right? The algorithm gives us D, we label it, we set up a for loop on its unlabeled neighbors, and, no, nope, E's already labeled. <gasps> oh, yeah. So this will never see, this Dijkstra's will never see this shortest path to E, because it was, pre it was, premature in saying that we were done with E. Okay? Now, other algorithms can handle this. Other algorithms aren't greedy. They don't shut the door immediately the first time you see something. They're more expensive. And I cannot remember whether the algorithm is Ford Fulkerson or Bellman Ford, but it's some algorithm that has a Ford in it. You should probably take away my PhD. Not knowing. <laughs> I don't know who had their hand up first. Go. So that's often, so I'm going to throw that back to you, um, and because that's a, a very common exam question that I actually would really like you to think about. Um, I'm not going to do it here publicly because we need to be done, but, but it's absolutely worth thinking about. Could we just bump up all the edges um, by, a, by the, the right amount and then run the algorithm? Would that work? And that's the one we throw back to you. Okay? Yeah? Yep. Um, depending on how you bump up the edges, um, there's sort of a, I mean, the sort of standard way would be to look at the most negative one and add that much, right? At least, is that what you were thinking? That's what comes to mind for me. I don't know another way, so it depends. Um, but Dijkstra's doesn't work with negative weight edges. So I don't, you know, there you go. I, I would question any of your strategies for doing this. Okay, yeah? Because then there wouldn't be any negative weight points. Well, but there might be, right? Like there might be a negative, there might be an application of directed edges where I don't know for whatever reason I get time back in my day if I go that direction instead of spending the other. Yeah. Sure, costs are not always positive. I will pay you to take this route. If you go this, if you go this route, I'll pay you money instead of instead of you paying me money. All right. Oh, look, that's the last slide. <gasps> we did it. It wasn't 15 hours. Okay, yes? Yes, Prim's algorithm is not on the exam. At least, if it is, we'll... <laughs> I mean, there's a chance that we would use it as the extra thing that we teach you about on the exam, but we would explain it clearly. But I'll also give you the heads up. Here's Prim's algorithm. Are you ready for it? I'll, I'll teach you about it today. Here's Prim's algorithm. Are you ready? I'll do this in green so we know that I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. This is it. <laughs> yes, yes. Almost nobody teaches Prim's algorithm this way, but it's true. Okay. 
<laughs> so now I know everything there is to know about Prim's algorithm. Check. We'll better, you will better get a room, man. <laughs> okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah. devices. Will you go back and hit stop on the video in the back, please? And I'll figure out how to hit stop on this one. Look, 